Sunday night, we are in a study on the book of Revelation. We have uh, covered so much territory on this book. We've, we're in about our 35th or 36th week uh, on this book, and we've covered most of the chapters fairly thoroughly. Uh, it takes a long time to cover this because there's so much to it. And we spent uh, about two and a half to three years studying the books of the kings, which whenever I've People want to know, when are you going back to the books of the Kings? Well, we went from 1 Samuel up to the fifth chapter of 2 Kings, uh, and it took us about three, three and a half years to do that. Well, what we're doing is we're finishing up some things on Revelation, and I'll be going back to 2 Kings in order to finish that up. But even when we get back to 2 Kings, it will take us back to the book of Revelation because we see the collapse of Israel and Judah in 2 Kings because they went after Baal in the grove for a five, well, actually an 800-year period, 500 years under kings and about 300 years under judges. And we've been studying the book of Revelation from the viewpoint of the number seven, and we've said this so many times, but I'll repeat it one more time. Seven is a perfect number. It's a number that has to do with completion. And the book of Revelation is a Jewish book. You've got, uh, you've got the seven candlesticks, which uh, the Scripture tells us in the 20th verse of the first chapter of Revelation that the seven candlesticks are the seven churches of Asia. And, of course, what we call Asia is not what they called Asia. When they said Asia, they meant the... They took the western part of what we call Turkey, and that was called Asia Minor. And that is where the seven churches of Asia were located. However, there were more than seven churches of Asia. Uh, you had many other churches in here that weren't mentioned in Revelation. And I, I've said this repeatedly, that I believe the reason God picked out seven, and he's got seven specific churches in the second and third chapter, and we'll get... We'll even go back to that. I don't know if we'll do it in this series, but I will do. I will go back to those two chapters. That'll take a lot of time to cover because you've got to cover each one of those churches. They're failing uh, in uh, whenever the Lord would say to the church of Ephesus, you've left your first love. That's the first church that's mentioned. And he goes on down through a second and third chapter of Revelation telling you the problem with each one of the churches. And the reason I believe that God picked out uh, seven is because seven, the book of Revelation is a Jewish book. Seven is a, it is in the Old Testament, it had a specific meaning among the Jews. And the cardinal number, when we say cardinal, we, we mean the numerical number seven had a meaning. It, it, the word seven, it actually is the word Shaba, S-H-A-B-A, or actually Sheba, S-H-E-B-A, the Queen of Sheba means the Queen of Seven is what it means. And uh, Shaba uh, is a word that comes from the very same cognate as the word Sheba. It is a cognate. And it's, it comes from the very same root word. Shaba means to take an oath. And it means to, to complete to the full, complete to the full, or it means to seven oneself. So whenever someone is sevened, to seven oneself, whenever someone is sevened, they go through what it takes to complete them. They go through all the fiery trials of life. And we see in the book of Revelation, we see throughout the first chapter, uh, we see the sevens that, that begin the book. We see the seven spirits over there uh, in chapter Seven, we see the seven churches, um, excuse me, chapter four. We see the seven churches mentioned in chapter four. We see the seven churches named individually uh, in chapter, in verse 11, the seven candlesticks in 12. And the seven candlesticks was the light inside the temple of God. So if you've got the candlesticks, you've got the temple. And I'll remind you that in the temple of God, you had uh, actually four pieces of furniture in the temple of God. Here's the temple. It faces, it faces east. The gate of the temple faces east. And you've got the, 
the uh, veil that divides the outer sanctuary from the inner sanctuary. In the inner sanctuary, you have the Ark of the Covenant. That's the main piece of furniture in the temple. In the Ark of the Covenant, God would come down out of the kind of glory cloud, like in that picture right there, and he would sit on top of the Ark of the Covenant, and that was his throne. So whenever you find the throne of God throughout Revelation, particularly in the fourth and fifth chapters, that is the Ark of the Covenant. Well, we've said so many times that in the Old Testament, you have the shadow, or not the real thing. That's the rituals in the Old Testament. The very image in the New, the very image in the New, well, in the Old Testament, God set up on the throne inside the, the inner sanctuary, and now God sits upon our, upon our hearts. He rules from our hearts. The law was written on tables of stone kept inside of the Ark of the Covenant. Now God writes upon fleshy tables of the heart. Then you got the three other pieces of furniture. In the outer sanctuary, you had the seven candlesticks. Well, when you see that, and you see the seven candlesticks as equated with the church or the refined church, that, that's got to signal something to you. This is a Jewish book. Well, of course, then you had the altar of incense uh, that set up here close to the veil, and they would take that altar of incense in once a year and put the uh, incense upon the altar, and then they would take fire from the altar out here, the brazen altar out here just on the east of the, east of the, temp of the tabernacle, that's where they killed all the sacrifices, the bullocks, the lambs. Uh, and this is where the horns of the altar were. It's had horns on it. And this is where if you were in trouble uh, and you had committed some crime or sin, you could come and grab hold of the horns of this altar. And it was sanctuary. Unless you were a murderer, then it wasn't a sanctuary. There was no safety there. So all the sacrifices were offered here. And any fire that was necessary to bring about the rituals of the tabernacle or the temple when it was installed and became uh, Solomon's temple, any fire came from this altar. And the, in, in fact, when they were going to uh, light the fire of the altar of incense, it was actually a square altar, when they was going to uh, light that fire, the fire had to be taken by a golden censer, a golden, it was made of beaten gold, and every piece of furniture inside the tabernacle was made of gold. The seven candlesticks were made of beaten gold. The altar of incense was made of gold. And when the Bible speaks of the golden altar in Revelation, it's talking about this right here. And when it, and of course the the incense from the altar was depicted as the prayers of the saints in the New Testament. Of course, you had the brazen sea right here, <coughs> a little bit to the southeast of the entrance to the temple, and then you had the table of showbread, and the table of showbread was made of beaten gold. <coughs> well, they had to take the golden censer from, from off. They had to take go out here and get coals from off, the altar where they had offered a sacrifice, a burnt offering up to God, and then they had to bring that fire in a golden censer and put it here upon the frankincense and uh, the various incenses that were put upon this. Well, that, this is probably, this is what where Nadab and Abihu, the two sons of Eleazar, when they offered strange fire, they were supposed to, with the golden censer, and you find the golden censer over here in the ninth chapter of Revelation. So this is a Jewish book. When the Bible speaks of the golden censer, in fact, let me see here if I can, uh, speaks of the, wait a minute, is that 16th chapter am I thinking of? Uh, hold on here. When he speaks of the golden censer, he's talking about uh, he's talking about bringing the fire from the uh, bringing the fire. Well, I can't locate what I'm looking for. I thought I knew this book. Uh, bringing the fire from the from the altar here to to this 
little altar right there, and that's probably Nadab and Abihu probably got fire from somewhere besides here. So they offered strange fire to God, and God killed them for it. Well, when you find the altar and the, and the censer and the, and the brazen altar and the glassy sea, and you find all of this, and you find the temple in the book of Revelation, what you're finding is you're finding a Jewish book. So this is Jewishness is what it is. Now, we're talking about the... We're talking about the seven stars there in the right hand of Christ in that first chapter. The seven stars in the right hand of Christ in the first chapter in verse 16. And the seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches. And of course, these seven angels are found all through the book. Anytime John would say, uh, and the angel of, uh, of the church of Ephesus uh, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, and then he, you've got each, each one of these chapters is talking about the angels coming down and talking to John, and we find the angels in chapter 8 with seven trumpets, and the trumpets, we've already said, the seven trumpets are, uh, the seven trumpets are the, are the voices of the refined church. Well, I found my... Here's the angel took the censer in verse 5 of chapter 8 and filled it with fire of the altar. Chapter 8, verse 5. He took... And the angel took the censer. They kept this censer somewhere where they kept all the, the, uh, uh, the uh, instruments of the temple. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth, but where they took that fire, they, they put it upon the uh, altar of incense. Well, this is just a spiritual picture of the literal over here. Now, we've been talking about the... We've gone through this, talked about the seven angels in Revelation 8, 9, and 10, and when the seventh one sounds in Revelation 10 and 7... In Revelation 11 and 15, when the seventh angel or the last trumpet sounds, we're going to be changed at the last trump. Now, there's seven trumpet sounds, Revelation 8, 9, and 10. When the seventh one sounds, we'll read it one more time. Uh, look at it with me. The angel comes, a mighty angel, came down from heaven in verse 1 of chapter 10. Uh, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was over his head. It's interesting that the word rainbow is the word iris. Iris. And iris was said to be the old goddess, goddess of, of the rainbow. That's what the iris was, rainbow. And of course, what's amazing is the iris of the eye... The iris of the eye is a wheel inside of a wheel. The inner part of the wheel is retractable right here. This part here is retractable. When you punch somebody in the eye, that closes up, and the bow bends back, and the eye bends back from the side. If you've got the eye like this, and here's the pupil of the eye, whenever you punch somebody in the eye here, that bow bends like that, and then and the eye becomes inflamed, and it closes up to protect what's in the eye. Well, in Zechariah, the second chapter, the, I believe it's verse 8, the scripture says that Israel is the apple of my eye, and the word apple is the word baba, and it means pupil. And of course, uh, what goes in the eye what goes into the pupil is light. And as it passes through prisms, and the first prism it passes through in the back of the eye, back of the entrance of the eye is the lens, and the lens of the eye is triangular-shaped prisms, one five-thousandths of an inch thick. That's what they are. I got that out of, uh, out of Gray's Anatomy. And when the light goes through the prisms, it breaks off into, it begins to refine into seven colors is what it does. 
So when we're talking about the rainbow here, and Iris was the goddess of the rainbow, and Israel is the apple of God's eye, then we see the relationship of the word rainbow, rainbow, and the iris, and the pupil, it is the bow of God that protects, that protects God's people. The church is in the middle of God's eye. That's what he sees. Now, where they get the word apple of the eye, when the kings would go out through the streets, and they would have a cart, and they would be riding in a cart, and they would have a big basket of apples, and, and they had particular uh, people in their kingdom that were some of their favorites in the kingdom, and as they would ride by in that cart, they would look at those people, and they were said to be the apple of their eye, and they would throw them an apple. That this was one of their favorite subjects. Well, the Bible says that we are the apple of God's eye, and we're in the middle of his iris, and that's the rainbow that's over the head of, this has to be Christ, it's what it has to be, and so we're in the midst of God's eye, and whenever you, whenever you touch the church, God says, you touch the apple of my eye, what happens when you touch the apple of his eye, his eye becomes inflamed, I asked a uh, my doctor, who did uh, cataract surgery on both my eyes, I said, what happens when you punch somebody in the eye? And he didn't know why I was asking. He said, well, the iris bends back, it becomes inflamed, and then it starts, and then the water comes out, and the eye starts running. Well, when the Bible speaks uh, in Genesis, the ninth chapter, that the fountains of the great deep were broken up when Noah got in the ark, the word fountain has to do with water, doesn't it? Well, the word fountain comes from the word A-Y-I-N, and that word ayin is the word eye. The eye of God, the fountains of God's eye broke up, and that was how the waters came upon the earth. Now, that's a figurative, or that's an, that's a, an abstract view of God's eye when he's... When his eye pours out, uh, when, it, when he's punched in the eye, then his eyes become flaming fire, don't they? Well, look, just let me show you that over in first, in first, uh, excuse me, Second Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians. Now, all of this is tied together, Second Thessalonians, uh, in verse chapter one. Verse 7, And to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. Why is he in flaming fire? And the time element of this is when the time factor of this is, is uh, Matthew 24 in verse 28. As the lightning shines from the east even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And he's coming back in flaming fire, or these are God's eyes, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We'll look over here in, look over here in Revelation 19. We see Christ coming back on a great white horse, in verse 11, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. This is the same time factor as Second Thessalonians uh, 1 and verse 8, in flaming fire. He's coming back in flaming fire. He's going to be revealed at this point. So this is the same time. The same thing, a different view of the same thing. I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. Why is that? Because he's been punched in the eye 
Whoever touches Israel touches the apple of his eye. Well, let's read that in Zechariah, the second chapter. Let's just look at that. So he's coming back with eyes as a flame of fire, Zechariah 2. And it's amazing how God takes the anatomy of man and works this into Scripture as though it's a biology lesson. And look here in chapter 2, verse 7. Deliver thyself, O Zion. And he's not talking about the literal mountain of Zion. Zion is, is a mountain in Jerusalem where the temple sits. And God is speaking of Israel who's in captivity in Babylon. And he says, Deliver thyself, O Zion, that dwellest with the daughter of Babylon. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, After the glory hath he sent me unto the nations which spoiled you, for he that toucheth you, Israel, the church, toucheth the apple, the baba, the pupil of his eye. That's why when he comes back, there's going to be a rainbow upon his head. And in the scripture, what they saw, they didn't see a rainbow over in Genesis, the ninth chapter. They saw the bow of God in the cloud. The word, is, the word means a war bow is actually what it means. It's a war bow. It doesn't mean just a rainbow. A rainbow is a war bow in the eyes of God. When he looks at something, this is what it's talking about. And you have seven colors in the rainbow. We're the light of the world. The light goes into the pupil. It goes through the... Uh, through the lens of the eye, which are hexagonal shaped prisms, and then the light begins to be refined in the cones. There are hundreds of thousands of cones, which are hexagonal shaped prisms. And, of course, the, uh, the seven candlesticks in Zechariah 4 and 10, the seven candlesticks are called the eyes of the Lord. So God's eyes, right in the center of God's eye is the church, and he looks at us, and we're the apple of his eye. And anyone who touches Israel touches the pupil of God's eye. And one day he's coming back with eyes as a flame of fire. I like what Alexander Hislop said. He said that, that the way you attack a man, you attack his wife. And the way the world is going to attack Jesus, they attack his wife, the church. So when he comes back, the reason he's going to have eyes as a flame of fire and the reason there's going to be an iris or a rainbow on his head, that's why this has to be Christ in the 10th chapter. It must be Christ because there is an iris or a war bow on his head. And around the iris is God's people. And this, the iris is a wheel and a wheel. And we see the wheel and the wheel in the first chapter of Ezekiel, in the ninth and tenth chapter of Ezekiel. Now let's go back over to, where was I here? Uh, the tenth chapter of Revelation. And I saw another mighty angel clothed with a cloud. This is Christ. And an iris, a rainbow, was upon his head, and his face, as it were, the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. Look back over here before we leave the rainbow. And go back over here to, by the way, the iris of the eye. I've said this, but let me, let me write it up here. The iris of the eye is a circle. The iris is a wheel. Let me, let me get me another pen. That is giving way. The iris is a wheel. There's a wheel. It's a wheel inside of a wheel. If this is the iris, and iris is the word rainbow, why isn't a rainbow circular? Well, it is. When you look at a rainbow from the top of a mountain and you're looking down at a rainbow, I've seen pictures of a rainbow from the top of a mountain. It is completely circular, just like the iris of the eye. And the pupil is the church, 
or the light goes into the pupil of the eye. Anyone who touches Israel, the bow of God bends back. He comes back with eyes as a flame of fire and he attacks. That's what's happening here in the 10th chapter of Revelation. This has to be Jesus. And look at the 4th chapter. Look at the 4th chapter. And I'm just, I'm tying some of this together so you'll see what it's about. In the fourth chapter, after this, verse 1, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet. And what I'm doing is trying to just correlate some of these things for you. So you can do some thinking on this yourself. I've done an entire series on this when I did the Eyes of the Lord series. A trumpet talking with me. Notice trumpets talk. Trumpets are voices. Even in the first chapter, verse 10, you find the trumpet speaking. So when you find seven angels are the messengers of the refined church, the seven churches, with trumpets, they have voices. A trumpet talking with me which said, Come up hither, I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately... I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Now, what's the throne? That's the Ark of the Covenant. What was the heavens called? That was the title for Israel. The heavens was the ruling class. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne. Round about the throne. Here's the throne of God. Round about the throne can actually be the entire temple or tabernacle. And that is us. Know you not that your body is the temple. So the rainbow or the bow of God is around us is that not what the iris is? It is around the church, isn't it? Because the pupil is in the middle of the eye. And there's a rainbow round the throne in the sight, likened to an emerald. And I'm not going any further than that, just to relate to you the, the rainbow of Revelation 10. And it is the same thing. It's the iris or the wheel inside of a wheel of Ezekiel, in fact, if you want to look at Ezekiel, the first chapter, we'll just look at this real quick. Look at this very quickly. Ezekiel, I don't have time to go through all of this. But look back here, Ezekiel, the first chapter. I don't, I'm not going to take time to explain all this. I'll just give you a little bit. We see the four creatures. What this is, I'm just going to give you a real quick summary of it, as best I can, without going into it for an hour and a half. When Ezekiel says in verse 4, I looked and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north. He's talking about the Babylonian armies coming down to attack Israel. The Babylonian chariot wheels were copied after the Assyrian chariot wheels. And the Syrian chariot wheels, they were a wheel inside of a wheel. That's what they were. In fact, I've got a picture of them here somewhere, I think. It was a wheel in a wheel. I may have it here. I don't know if I've got it or not. I may not have brought that with me. But the Assyrian chariot wheels... They were a wheel inside of a wheel. That's, they were made like, I've got, and what's amazing, what's amazing about the Assyrian chariot wheels is that they were a, they were, you can see when they're made, the Babylonian war chariot wheels, they were made like this. And it was a wheel inside of a wheel. It was made like the iris of the eye. And in the middle of the wheel, in the middle of the wheel, they had one. 
what they had, the war chariots were six spokes. When you connect the six spokes, what you've got is hexagon. It's hex, you've got a hexagonal shaped prism inside the eye going through the lens. When you get inside the layer of the eye, it is hexagonal shaped prisms. When you look at the candlesticks from the top, the floral pattern on the Ark of Titus is a hexagonal shaped prism prism. So the, the Assyrian war chariots were built like the human eye and when you take the hexagonal shaped prism and you connect the, you take the, the six, uh, let me draw it different here. When you take the hexagonal, when you take the six spokes of the Syrian war chariots and you connect them this way, what you've got is the Star of David. And from the top, the Star of David, and the Bible said, these seven, looking at the floral pattern from the top, these seven are the eyes of the Lord. The Syrian war chariots, the pupil of the eye, the iris, David's star, and of course, the rabbi said that David wore the menorah on his shield, but looking at the menorah from the top, it is a hexagonal shape. It's hexagon shaped, or it is a six-pointed star, and this is called the shield of David. Now, let's just look at this in Ezekiel. I have to tie this in together when you get to the rainbows, you get to the rainbow of Revelation 4 and Revelation 10. Look here in Ezekiel, the first chapter. This is the Assyrian war chariots coming down. And on the side, this is the Babylonian war chariots, which were patterned. When I say Assyrian war chariots, let me tell you why I say that. The Assyrians invented the chariots, the war chariots. They were the inventors of the war chariots. Everyone else patterned their chariots after the Assyrians. That's what they did. Now, now we see on the side of the Assyrian war chariots, they had these cherubim or cherubim, and they had and and they had these. Some of them were like lions, some were like eagles, some were like uh, uh, like an ox, some was like a man, and that's why we see these beasts with four faces in verse ten. And as for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man, the face of a lion on the right side, and they four had the face of an ox on the left side, and they four also had the face of an eagle. Now these are the four creatures that God formed his covenant with. When Noah came out of the ark, God said, I'll make a covenant with the cattle of the field, with the beast of the field, with the fowl of the air, and with man. Of course, the king of the beast is the lion. The king of the birds is the eagle. The king of the cattle is the ox and man. So when you see this, you see God's covenant with man. Look here in verse, verse 15. Now I beheld the living creatures. Behold, one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures with his four faces and the appearance of the wheels and their work was likened to the color of beryl. Now beryl is what? Huh? Amber. Amber. Now, or yellow or amber, a light yellow or amber. In the middle of the eye, in the midst of the eye, here's the iris, here's the pupil, right directly in the back of the eye, straight, you put a diameter straight into the middle of your eye, go to the back, you have something called the fovea. A fovea, C-E-N-T-R-A-L-I-S, are the yellow spot. That's what they call it. Get that out of Gray's Anatomy. Now, he says, it had the likeness of amber or beryl, and they four had one likeness, and their appearance and their work was, as it were, a wheel in the middle of a wheel. You hear the old song, Ezekiel saw the wheel? Way up in the middle of the air. 
and it was a wheel and a wheel. And when they went, they went upon their four sides, and they turned not when they went. That's because these cherubim, these beasts, were emblems of the Babylonian and Assyrian Empire, and they had them on the sides of their chariots. And for their rings, or their, the curves or the rounded rims of the chariots, they were so high they were dreadful, and their rings were full of eyes round about them. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went by them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up whithersoever. This is the Assyrian war chariots coming in to slaughter Israel, or slaughter southern Judah. Whithersoever the spirit was to go, they went, and thither was their spirit to go, and the wheels were lifted up over against them, for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. Now, I don't, I'm not going to take time to go through all that, but when you look at the human eye, it was built like the Assyrian war chariot wheels, or the Babylonian war chariot wheels. And when, they, and when the rabbis saw the wheels of these chariots coming into the city, it had to frighten them to death because God had to visit some uh, pagan blacksmith and cause him to want the, to build these war chariots exactly like the human eye. Now you say, God wouldn't do that? That's just one of his many miracles I believe he did. He caused them to do that. First time I looked in McClinic and Strong and I saw the Assyrian war chariot wheels. I may be able to find it real quick. Let me see here if I can find it. Uh, look under wheel. I think it's under wheel. When I first time I looked at it, I had studied the eye, the human eye and all. And when I saw it, it shocked me. I said, that's made the way the human eye is made. Let's see if I can find it here. I think it's under wheel. Here it is right there. That's it right there. You see the six spokes. The peacetime chariots were eight-spoked wheels. The war chariots were six spokes. And you see it's got a wheel inside here, a wheel right here. And it's got, and it has a wheel on the outside. And it's a, it was a wheel made inside of a wheel. And they connected these wheels with what they called these fellows. They were kind of like dovetails. <coughs> and they've got 24 of these fellows. That's what's amazing there. That hold this wheel inside of this wheel. That has a similarity to the human eye. And what's amazing is when these chariot wheels came in, <coughs> remember right in the center of the eye is the yellow spot or the fovea centralis. And that the fovea starts refining. The fovea is the major cone inside the eye. It's directly in the center of the eye. What is directly in the center of these wheels? The scythes. Mary said it. The scythes are those little sword-like things that went out on the side of the wheels. And those scythes, Nahum says in Nahum the second chapter, that they ran like fire. They, they were like lightnings in the street. The reason they were like lightnings in the street is those wheels were, were turning fast. They were cutting down Israel. And the, and the sun was glinting on them. And the picture of fire all through the scripture is yellow. So right in the center of the, of the Babylonian war chariot wheels was the yellow spot. Huh? And it's, yeah, it's in Ben-Hur, but it, when they, and they call these chariots of iron. You could not come against chariots of iron if you had no chariots. They would slaughter those big, huge horses, would just run over the people. Anybody got close to them, it would cut them all to pieces. And that's, and that's where the yellow come from. So the wheel of the chariot is like the human eye. The iris is God's bow. The pupil is us. The bow bends back when anyone touches us. And this is how God touched them with these war chariots when they came in. And it had a yellow spot right in the middle 
of the wheel in a wheel, the same way the, the, same way the human eye was constructed. Very interesting. If you, I, if you don't have the... I did that all on the Eyes of the Lord series back several years ago. I should go into it again one day and teach the whole thing, but it's very interesting. Let's go back to Revelation. Where was I? Revelation 10 or Revelation 4? Okay, Revelation 4. We see uh, Revelation 4. Wait a minute, I'm flipping too far. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow and iris around the throne. In the Old Testament, God sat up on the throne or upon the Ark of the Covenant. Well, the Ark of the Covenant is equated with our hearts now. So God is around His throne now spiritually, and that is our hearts. That's our understanding, isn't it? So, this, so the, the bow of God... Well, what would that be? A flaming fire, right? Around God's people. Let me show you something on that. Go back to Zechariah 2. The iris of the eye is like when you punch someone in the eye, it becomes like flaming fire, doesn't it? It becomes inflamed and it becomes red. Well, here's another way to look at this and equate this. Didn't mean, mean to get off on the rainbow, but we really need to touch on the rainbow to understand it doesn't just mean some pretty thing in the sky. It has much to do with, with Old Testament. Look here in Zechariah, the second chapter. So the picture of the, the, iris, around the, uh, the uh, iris around the pupil would be a picture of fire, wouldn't it? Huh? Wouldn't it be a picture of fire around the people of God? In fact, it would be a wall of fire, wouldn't it? That's exactly what it would be. It would be the judgment of God around the people of God. And look here in Zechariah, the second chapter. Second chapter, verse 5. Well, let's read 4 and 5. And he said unto him, this young man, Run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem in the future shall be inhabited as towns without walls to protect them anymore for the multitude of men and cattle therein. For I, saith the Lord, will be unto her a wall of fire round about and will be the glory in the midst of her. So the fire is going to be around us, isn't it? And that is our protection. That's the iris of God. That's his rainbow. That's what this is talking about. Now, people say, God wouldn't make all that stuff equate with biology and with physics and chemistry and human anatomy. Yes, he would. Why do you think? He said, Israel is the pupil of my eye. Certainly he would. Go back over here to Revelation 10. <laughs> So this has to be Christ. He's the mighty angel in verse 1. He's got a rainbow upon his head. And what's amazing? When they looked at the rainbow, when Noah came out of the ark, when we look at a rainbow after a rain or during a rain or something, what we see is the bow upward, don't we? That's the way we see it. The bow is upward and here's all the colors right here. Right here. We see it that way. We don't even usually see all the rest of it. Whenever they hung a bow with the bow upward back in ancient times, when they hung it bowed like that up on a wall, it was, they were not at war. They were at peace. But when they hung the bow, when they came in and hung their bows on the wall with the bow downward, that meant they were at war. A broken bow meant they had given in to their enemy and surrendered to them. Well, when Christ is coming back with eyes as a flame of fire, the bow has to be this way, doesn't it? Because he's coming back to make war on anyone who has touched the church, his wife. Now let's go back over here to Revelation 10. So we see Christ with an iris on his head or the rainbow was upon his head, verse 1, and his face, as it were, the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. 
And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot upon the earth. This has to be Jesus. And because, it has to be Jesus because the bow is on his head. Because a war bow, he's coming back with eyes as a flame of fire. And cried with a loud voice, and when, as when a lion roareth, and when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. I don't know what they were. I've never been able to figure that out. Probably nobody will. And the angel which I saw, or Christ, with the bow, or the iris upon his head, stand upon the sea, upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven, and the things that therein are, and the earth, and the things that therein are, and the sea, and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. This is Christ standing with one foot on the land, the other on the sea, with the iris on his head. Or the bow of fire. This is a picture of, this is the same time factor as 2 Thess Thessalonians 1 and 7 and 8, where he's coming back in flaming fire. It's the same as Revelation, the 19th chapter, when he's got eyes as a flame of fire. It's the same as over there in Matthew, the 24th chapter, where the scripture says there in verse uh, 27, For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. What is this shining? What is this shining in verse 27 of chapter 24? That's the eyes as a flame of fire, isn't it? It's the same thing. It's the same time factor, and it's the same picture of Christ coming back in flaming fire, eyes as a flame of fire, because he's been punched in the eye, because someone has, someone has touched his wife, the church, for a three and a half year period, a time, time, and half a time, or for 1,260 days, which is exactly three and a half years on a 360-day year Jewish calendar. The church is going to go under great siege before this is over with, and there will be great tribulation such as not from the beginning, no, nor ever shall be, and that's why Jesus is going to be enraged, because he is being punched in the eye. He says, I won't put up with it. Now, let's, now, when he comes back and he's got the rainbow on his head, he's got the iris, the time factor of this is the last trump, isn't it? The next verse says so. The time factor of this is his coming back at the end of time at the sounding of the seventh trump or the last trump. The time factor is when he is in the skies in flaming fire upon a great white horse... The time factor is when he's a wall of fire about us. The time factor is the lightning shining from the east to the west. The time factor is the same as the fourth chapter of 1 Thessalonians. We which are alive and remain, the word remain, perilipa, means to survive a great slaughter. We which are alive and survive the great slaughter because the world has been punching God in the eye, touching his wife. We'll not go before those that are asleep, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. The time factor of that is Jesus with eyes as a flame of fire. It's all the same time element that we're talking about, and that's when he comes back in verse 7, in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound the mystery of God, or the church is finished, the end of time is here, Christ has the rainbow on his head, he has got the iris, 
And we're right in the center of his eye. And we have been slaughtered. This is an allegory. This is idiomatic language is what it is. You miss that and you miss it all. Do I believe that God has taken the word of God, inspired his word with chemistry formulas and algebraic formulas in it? He's the one that invented algebra and discovered algebra and calculus, not Pythagoras, not Archimedes, not any of these great famous mathematicians of old. They just simply discovered God's laws, God's rules, and we, found them in, we find them in this book, don't we? God's revealing them. And I have had people say, well, the secret things belong to the Lord. God wants to keep us stupid and dumb so we will never learn nothing. No. The reason men can't find these things is they don't define enough words. I mean, what you need to do is get you a... A lot of this I get out of this book right here. I've got one at home. I keep one here, Gray's Anatomy. You're going to go take... A, you're going to go to college and become a doctor. You enter your first year of college. They tell you, go get a Gray's Anatomy. That's on your book list. That's what you got to get. And you can find these things out in Gray's Anatomy. You can actually see the wheel in the wheel. There it is right there. Look here. There it is right there. Can you see that? There's the wheel. There's the outer side of the iris. And the inner wheel is right there. I didn't make that up. People think, Jim must have made that up. I got it out of Gray's Anatomy. And if you want to study a little bit of science along with the Bible, I'll leave that open there if anybody wants to look at it. It's a wheel in a wheel. It's what it is. And it's got a yellow spot in the middle. And the Babylonian war church is a wheel in the wheel. And it's got a yellow spot in the middle. <laughs> if that's... You know what? It would be uncanny if it wasn't the Word of God. Wouldn't it? It's not uncanny. God created it that way. God goes to some ignorant, barbarian, Babylonian blacksmith says, make this wheel this way. And the guy says, I think I'll make this wheel this way. I think I'll put six spokes in it. For some reason, this will go better in battle. And he makes it. Huh? He does. He uses bases to mend to confound the wise. And that's, he takes some old, some guy that invents the Assyrian war chariots. And the guy sits there and builds an Assyrian war chariot wheel with the same kind of dimension the human eye has. The same structure. Isn't that amazing? Now, we know that there's so much of this ties together. Goodness sakes, I want to go somewhere else, but I ain't got time. Revelation 10, Christ has got the iris on his head. That's the war bow. That is his eye. That's the iris. In the middle of his iris is the pupil. That's us. Mess with the pupil. The bow bends back. Judgment comes. Isn't it amazing that when the fountains of the great deep were broken up, the word fountain is a derivative. It's a cognate of the word I or ion. And the word ion, the word ion, A-Y-I-N, when the Bible says that in the midst of the wheel was the color of amber, the word ion is actually the word I, or it's the word color. What it is, not C-O-L-O-R. I'm spelling it the way they translate in the Bible, C-O-L-O-U-R. It's the word color, and whenever we see, when we see things, when the light goes into the eye, God sees us, doesn't he? It's so, it's so amazing when the Bible says, and Jesus beheld the young man, the rich young ruler. The word behold means to fix the eye upon. Jesus never beheld the Pharisees. He never fixed his eye on them. They didn't belong to him. Uh, and he did it to Peter. He looked at Peter. He fixed his eye. That's because we're in the center of his eye. That's what we are. I was going to tell you something, and I forgot what it was. 
That's right. I fix our eyes only on Christ that's in others. We're not to fix our eyes on the world. That's exactly right. I was going to give you something else. And I was, oh, yeah. You find Christ... When we look at something, we, you do not see lines and shapes. That's not what you see. What you see is refined colors, refracted colors, the separation of color in your eye. That's what you see. You see colors is what it is. And when you run light, and we're the light of the world, through prisms... It breaks off into seven colors. Seven is the number of divine refinement. It means to be completed. Now Christ, we see Christ here in the 10th chapter represented in colors, don't we? Look at it. And a rainbow was up on his head. There's seven colors in the rainbow. And his face was, as it were, the sun. The sun certainly is light, but it's depicted by color. And his feet as pillars of fire. Now, I went through these colors when I went through the eyes of the Lord. I'm not going to go through any of these right now. But look over here in the first chapter of Revelation. Go to the first chapter of Revelation. First chapter of Revelation, verse 13. In the midst of the seven candlesticks. What if I said in the midst of the... What is in the middle of the chariot wheels? The scythes or the yellow. Yellow is a picture of fire. What does fire do? It refines us, doesn't it? refined. It's always a picture of yellow. What's in the middle of the eye? The fovea or the yellow spot. Well, in the midst of the candlesticks, when you look at the candlesticks from the top, the floral pattern is this. It's either this star of David or it's a six hagen. It's a, it's a hexagonal shaped prism. It's hexagon. It's six sides. In the midst of the candlesticks is what? Is Christ, is one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle? We see gold there. Gold is, a, gold is the picture of refinement all through the Scriptures. His head and his hair were white, like wool, white is always the picture of righteousness. His eyes were as a flame of fire. That's the picture. Fire is always the picture of yellow, isn't it? And why is his eyes as a flame of fire? He's been punched in the eye. And his feet like unto fine brass. Brass has color to it. They usually meant... When they said brass, it was usually some kind of copper, had more of a red tint to it. Of course, red is a picture of the blood of Christ. As if they burned in a furnace, and his voice is the sound of many waters, not going into colors, just pointing it out to you. Look at Daniel. I believe it's Daniel 10. Go back to Daniel. <laughs> Look here in Daniel. All I'm going to do is read it to you. We'll come back to it one day. Here's Daniel seeing a picture of Christ. Verse 5. Then I lifted up mine eyes and looked. Daniel 10 verse 5. Then I lifted up mine eyes and looked. And behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold, of Euphaz, look up these colors. I did. I went through the colors. I, I can't remember all the notes that I did on these colors. I remember some of it. His body also was like beryl, like the yellow spot. And his face, as the appearance of lightning, 
in his eyes as lamps of fire. This is Christ, isn't it? It has to be Christ. Christ is always described as the one with eyes of fire. Like in color, ayin is the word color, like the eye. Like in color to polish brass, in the voice of his words, like the voice of a multitude. We see Christ pictured in these different elements in colors. Each one of them has, they have a meaning. And people say, oh, I just don't think all that means anything. Well, you just keep thinking that and stay in ignorance. Now, let's go back over here to the 10th chapter of Revelation. So when he comes back with the bow on his head, with the iris on his head, we're in the center of the iris, and the, the world and the church is attacked by the great world beast system for three and a half years, time, time, and half a times 1260 days or 42 months, half of seven years or the last 70 weeks of Daniel. And when the church goes under fire, then God, and the, that's not the only time the church has been attacked for the last 2,000 years, haven't they? Well, the church, it actually was Israel. We've been attacked from the beginning. And only spiritual Israel goes to heaven, not whether you were in literal Israel. And then you look over here back to chapter 11. Well, I don't know if I should go here. Let me see here. Well, I will just, I'll go ahead and give you this. I won't give you much on it. The two witnesses, that is the priest and the king. These are the two olive trees that were anointed, that stood by God in the Old Testament. And the two anointed ones was the priest and the king. Now he's made us priests and kings. This is the church. I, I, I've done a lot of tapes on that. You want the tapes, I'll give you the tapes. No need me going through it right now. Verse 7, and when they, the two witnesses, not Moses and Elijah, when the church has finished their testimony, the word testimony is the word marturia, M-A-R-T-U-R-I-A. -A. We get the word martyr from that. When they have been martyred, when they have been martyred, we get the word mature. Wait a minute, that's when we become sevened, isn't it? When we're sevened, then we're mature, we're martyred, and this is the attack of the church, and this is punching Jesus in the eye. That's what it is. When he comes back with eyes as a flame of fire. Why would Daniel 10 talk about Jesus with eyes as a flame of fire? Why would the first chapter of Revelation talk about Jesus with eyes as a flame of fire? Revelation, the 19th chapter, eyes as a flame of fire. And then in flaming fire, 2 Thessalonians 1 and 8. And then Israel is the pupil of his eye. In Zechariah 2 and 8. That's because he equates all of this with our eye, with our eyeball. That's what he does. And when they, the church, shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war with the wife of Christ, with the church. And God's eyes will become inflamed and shall overcome them and kill them and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom in Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. It's not just merely talking about a literal Jerusalem. What was Jerusalem? Who dictated to Jerusalem during the first century? The Pharisees. The Pharisees synagogue worship, all of their halakha that finally developed into the mission of the Talmud was a Babylonian system. It was Babylon that crucified Christ. It was Babylonian Pharisees. So it's, this is a figurative picture. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies the bodies of the saints, the church, three days and a half. What's that? Half of seven days 
or half of seven years on a Jewish calendar, 1260 days, time, time, and half a time, 42 months. 1260 days is exactly half of seven years on a 360 day year Jewish calendar. Exactly half. So for three and a half days, or the last three and a half years, shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. Now, what does that mean? It doesn't just merely mean they won't be buried. One of the greatest desecration that you could do in the first century was to desecrate a body and not put it in the ground or not put it into a tomb and bury it. They would drag bodies around. They would uh, uh, beat on them after they were already dead. Uh, uh, this was something they did to the early Christians. They would desecrate their body, hang their heads out, cut their heads off, hang their bodies up to be taunted and jeered at, and they would throw rocks at it and do all kinds of uh, insulting things to the bodies of the believers. And they, shall, they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and send gifts to one another. I wonder if this is Christ's mass, huh? Because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt upon the earth. And after three days and a half, after the last three and a half years of the tribulation, the spirit of life from God entered into them. What is that? That's the resurrection. That's the end of... That's the end of time. That's the sounding of the seventh trumpet right there. Isn't it? Sounding the seventh trumpet. And they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them which saw them. This is allegoric language is what it is. They will see us in eternity and great fear will come on them while they're being cast into hell. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, to the two witnesses, to the church, come up hither, and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. In the same hour where there was a great earthquake, now, you find the earthquake throughout the, throughout the book of Revelation. The great earthquake is the earthquake that comes and destroys Babylon. You find it over there in the sixth chapter. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal in verse 12, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became as blood and the stars of heaven fell into earth in verse 13, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Well, I think that sounds like the end of time too, doesn't it? In 6, 12, and 13. And the heaven departed as a scroll. Are y'all looking at that in chapter 6? Look at chapter 6. The same hour was the great earthquake. The same hour as when we're caught up to meet the Lord in the air. A great earthquake. We see the sixth seal open in verse 12. A great earthquake, the sun becomes black as sackcloth of hair, the moon became as blood, the stars of heaven fell upon the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, and what are the seven stars in the right hand of Christ? The, the refined message of the church, and when the first angel, and when, the, and when you go back to chapter 8, the third angel sounded, there fell a great star from heaven. So the stars of heaven falling to earth in verse 13 equate with the third angel sounding in verse 10 of chapter 8. The, the fifth angel sounding in verse, chapter 9 verse 1. The fifth angel sounded and I saw a star fall from heaven. In, in Matthew the 24th chapter, hold your place in these places here and look at the 24th chapter. 24th chapter of Matthew. The apostles said, one of these things, men, what will be the sign of thy coming of the end of the world? <clears throat> Verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. You remember this morning we read from the third chapter of Micah 
And, the, and when the prophets had no prophecy, the sun was darkened. It's talking about when there's no light. There's no truth. That's what it's talking about in that third chapter of Micah. The sun is darkened. The moon shall not give her light. And the stars shall fall from heaven. The powers of heaven shall be shaken. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in clouds of heaven with power and great glory. What's the time factor here? At the end of time, the last trump, when Christ comes back with eyes as a flame of fire, because verse 31 says, He shall send His angels with the great sound of a trumpet, the last trump, and they shall gather together His elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. See that? Go back to Revelation 11. Or go back to Revelation 6. You see this earthquake in Revelation 6 and 12. There was a great earthquake, verse 12. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. I ought to read that verse out of Micah 3. Shouldn't I? The one I read this morning, to show the sun being darkened. Go back to Micah, the third chapter that I read this morning. Look here. This, the Old Testament will give you your answers to these things. I hope you can see a lot of this is complex, but you know what it is? It's God's way of expressing these things to us. Remember this morning we talked about the Lord concerning the prophets, chapter 3, verse 5. They preach lies. They cry peace. He that putteth not into their mouths, they even prepare war against him. Therefore, night shall be unto you. The sun will be darkened. It'll be like night. It'll be like sin. There'll be very little light. Remember, the scorpions blocked the light, didn't they? The locusts blocked the light. Scorpions are false teachers. No truth, that's it. Verse 6 of chapter 3 of Micah. Therefore, night shall be unto you, and ye shall not have a vision... There'll be darkness, and it shall be dark unto you. He uses the word dark to denote no truth of God. And ye shall not divine, and the sun shall go down over the prophets, and the day shall be dark over them. Did y'all catch that this morning when I read that? That's what I was talking about. The sun turns to darkness. That's an old idiom. It's an idiomatic phrase. It meant no truth. Next verse where? Okay, then shall the seers be ashamed and the dividers confounded. Yea, they shall all cover their lips for there is no answer of God. Now I go back over here. Where was I? It's chapter 6. Chapter 6. We're talking about the earthquake of chapter 11, verse 13. Chapter 11, but look at 6. We see the earthquake. This is the end of time. Verse 14. This is Christ coming back as the lightning shines from the east to the west. It's going to be like a scroll, isn't it? I've said before, how does the lightning shine from the east to the west? East to west is all the way around the world, isn't it? Isn't it? Here's the world. East to west is like that. If God opens the top like a can opener, that's going to be like a scroll, isn't it? Well, that's what he's saying right here. Here's the same time factor as Matthew 24, 27. As the lightning shines from the east to the west, the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. What was a mountain? Ruling cities of empires. All the heads of the world are going to be moved out of their place. And the kings of the earth and the great men who rule these mountains and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains and said unto the mountains and rocks, Follow us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne from the wrath of the Lamb. Well, if the wrath of the Lamb here, 
The same time factor is the same time factor as when his eyes are a flame of fire, when he comes back in flaming fire, isn't it? What? Well, that and right there, it all depends on the context. Yeah. They're going to be trying to hide from God. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? The same time factor there is when his eyes are as a flame of fire. When he comes back, he's been punched in the eye, his wife has been attacked. Back to... And you see the, the earthquake, you see it throughout Revelation, but specifically you see it over here in chapter 16. Chapter 16, verse 17. The seventh angel poured out his vial upon the, into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake. That's the same earthquake of chapter 11. Because in chapter 11, after the two witnesses finished their testimony or their martyrdom, then they're attacked by the beast. That's attacking the apple of his eye, the church. There was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake, so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. In verse 21 of chapter 16, There fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every one stone about the weight of a talent, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail. For the plague thereof was exceeding great. Now back to Revelation 11. What's the represent? Well, I have wrestled with this. It could be a financial collapse. It could be a financial collapse and literal earthquakes because we have many earthquakes in the world. It's as though the world is in a... Well, when the scripture says that if a man stiffens his neck and he's often reproved, he'll be suddenly cut off and that without remedy. Well, the, God used the same idea when he says that at the end of time, there in Revelation, in uh, Luke 21, 25, that there'll be, dis there'll be uh, distress, of, there'll be signs in the moon and the stars and on the earth distress of nations with perplexity. The word perplexity, aporia, A-P-O-R-I-A, means in a quandary with no answer. It very well can be literal earthquakes because we got those going like crazy, don't we? We've got more earthquakes, more monsoons, more typhoons, more hurricanes, more tropical storms in the past 50 to 60 years than we've had in the last 500 years. I, I've told you before, I... I read an article where they've got uh, 20,000 trimmers in one town in southern Japan alone. 20,000 trimmers a day. Now, I don't know how they measure those. And we're sitting on the Madrid That's right. Expecting it to go the They're expecting this to go. They're expecting San Andreas in California to go. I have been in an earthquake in Memphis on the San Andreas on the Mississippi River. I was in my sister's house back in the mid-60s, and the house started shaking. Scared everybody to death. The, the San Andreas is going to go. They're saying that that is long overdue, but the big one is going to go down through Tokyo. I saw a special on earthquakes one night, and, and Martin Sheen was narrating it, and he said, the largest fault in the world goes right through downtown Tokyo. He said it's the largest fault upon the face of the earth and that it's long overdue. And if it goes, thousands of buildings will go down. And when they go down, America owed at that time, this was that six or seven years ago, America owed Japan a trillion dollars. And he said if that happened, they would call all these loans due. It would bankrupt America immediately. It could be literal earthquakes. It can be financial earthquakes. The word is size. It comes from the word seismo, 
that's a Greek word. It means to shake. It doesn't just mean to shake the ground. We get the word seismograph from that. And sio means to, when the Bible says, no man should be moved by these afflictions, the word is sios, and it comes from sight. We get the word seismo or seismograph from that. It means to shake. It doesn't just mean an earthquake. It means a shaking. So is finances of America going to shake? Is the economy going to shake? Is the economy of the world going to shake? Is the, uh, are the elements shaking the world? Is El Nino shaking the world? Are the earthquakes shaking? This thing's in a mess. I, I should, I've been talking about it on Sunday morning on, yeah. It's all of them together, yeah. I believe it's everything that doesn't have an answer to it. We have a shaking of nations, a shaking of wars, a shaking of the ground, a shaking of the sky, a shaking of winds and storms. Now, most people didn't start talking about the El Nino factor until the early 90s. Peter Jennings, Tom Brokaw didn't start talking about it then. I've been following El Nino since the late 60s. I've been watching it watching it in any articles I could find or magazines, looking at El Nino. El Nino is it's the warming of the waters off of the coast of Argentina, and, the, and it's the trade winds quit blowing there, and what it is, it's an evaporation of the waters into the stratosphere and up into the atmosphere, and all of this is carried around all over the world and is causing all of these... Uh, causing all of these droughts, these rains, these uh, every kind of weather pattern changes, erratic, just tremendously erratic weather changes. And it got so bad in the early 90s that the big major newscasters had to start talking about it. But I've been watching it a long time. There's a specific rim around Japan that's called, that's called the Ring of Fire. Mm-hmm. It's uh, it, on the ocean constantly. And if in Japan, when they lost World War II, they won it. Because we rebuilt them and built them the biggest Wall Street, one of the biggest Wall Streets in the world. And now they manufacture everything and sell it to us. And that's what they wanted to begin with when they attacked Pearl Harbor. They wanted the oil from the Dutch West Indies. And so they said, we have to stop the Americans first. And so we said, well, we'll whip you in war and we'll give you more in the oil. We'll give you an entire industry and all the oil to go with it. Isn't that funny? They won. I don't care if they won. <laughs> I don't care what the world does. <laughs> I think it's, it's just funny, isn't it? It's, it's crazy. Where was I? Look back over here in chapter 11, verse 13. In the same hour, the same hour is what? When they, the voice says, come up hither to the two witnesses to the church when they resurrect at the last trump. The same hour was there a great earthquake and the tenth part of the city fell and in the earthquake were slain of men 7,000. Now, all I can say about the 7,000 is there were 7,000 that didn't bow the knee to Baal. Seven is the number of divine refinement. This has to have some idiomatic meaning to it. And the tenth of the city, ten was a secular perfect number. And the remnant were frightened and gave glory to God of heaven. And the second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And the third woe was the very last trump. When he says the third woe cometh quickly, it follows immediately on the heels of the second woe. And the seventh angel sounded. That's the third woe. And there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are come, the kingdoms of our Lord. It is Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. That two things happen when the seventh trumpet sounds. The mystery of God is finished, verse 7 of chapter 10, and he conquers all of his enemies. In verse 15, chapter 11, and is the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. That's why there can't be a pre-trib rapture, mainly because we're going to be changed at the last trump. And if we're going to be changed at the last trump, death reigns all through the tribulation. The last three and a half years, the church is going to go under attack 
the two witnesses is going to go under attack. They're going to attack the apple of God's eye, the world beast system. That's in essence attacking Christ. When they attack God, they're not going to aim missiles at the sky and try to shoot Jesus out of the sky when he comes back. First of all, he ain't going to be up there very long. We're going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye. And he's not going to need our help. What's he going to need our help for? He's going to be in the midst of the sky. And I believe the white horse is just allegory because Anytime anyone rode a white horse in the first century, he was a commanding general of an army. All that is a picture. It's a picture showing of who Jesus is. But when he comes back, it's not like, okay, men, get your swords. Okay, okay, like Robin Hood. Okay, did you get hit? Watch out. No, it's going to be. Zap, you're all dead. That's it. It's, well, not zap. It's not even going to take this much time. It's zap. It's to say zap. It's... You know, it's just, and they're dead. They're gone. He's not going to need us to help him fight. Somebody was talking about how that, somebody told me recently about they had a big offering or something going on in the Middle East. Was that you, Kerry, one of y'all? They had some bunch of money they was trying to gather in the Middle East so they could gather up, they could have a big offering so they could build up a big munitions pile to, and a bunch of nuclear warheads to help Jesus fight when he comes back. I mean, what's Jesus need with a nuclear warhead? I mean, he goes out here and goes, and he has even a supernova out there a trillion miles out in space, and it has more light and more power than all the lights in the universe at once. What does he need with a nuclear warhead? It's kind of like saying, Jesus, would you like this firecracker to help whip these guys with? It's real dumb, isn't it? How much time do I have? Huh? Nine minutes. Nine minutes. Well, all right. I ain't got time to hardly go anywhere on this. I'm glad, though, we covered the rainbow. So you understand, that's the war bow. In fact, let me show you this. As long as Let's go back to Genesis 9. Go back to Genesis, the ninth chapter. Let's just look at this. Wait a minute. Let me get my old Bible. I have some notes in it I might want to look at. Let me get my, get my uh, Dead Sea Scrolls over here. All right. Chapter 9. Chapter 9. Hold on. All right. In verse, he comes out of the, let's just read from verse 8. God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you, and with your seed after you, and with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl. When you see these four beasts in the first chapter of Ezekiel, in the fourth chapter of Revelation, it's, this is a depiction of the covenant of God because each one of the beasts has the face of an eagle, the face of a lion, the face of an ox, the face of man. These are the four that God established his covenant with. They are called cherubim or cherub. We say cherubim. Of the fowl, the king is the eagle. Of the cattle, the king is the ox. Of every beast of the earth, the king of the beast is the lion, and with you, man. When you see these four beasts in Revelation, in Ezekiel, with these four faces, it is a picture of God's eternal covenant with his people. And from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth... I will establish my covenant with you, neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood, neither shall there be any more be a flood to destroy the earth. 
And God said, this is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. The covenant will never cease. Who picked it up later after Noah? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. The covenant was here in the garden with Adam. And I do set my bow. Not my rainbow. It was a rainbow. And the iris was the goddess of the rainbow. The word is keseth. Q-E-S-H-E-T-H. Q-E-S-H-E-T-H. That is the word bow. And it means a bending. A bending. What do you do with a bow? When you bend it, you put your, your foot on the inside of it, and you pull it back, and you bend the bow. It's a war bow is what it is. He said, I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a token of the covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud and I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh and the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh and go back to the seventh chapter go back to the seventh chapter in verse 11 in the 600th year of Noah's life verse 11 in the second month, in the seventeenth day of the month, the same day was all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were open. This is a picture and a type of the eye of God, God being punched in the eye by all these evil people before the flood. The word fountain is the word mayanah, M-A-Y-A-N-A-H. It is a derivative, a derivative of that is the word A-Y-I-N. means an eye. The eye of God, and if you'll notice, when you punch someone in the eye, the tears flow, don't they? Water flows forth. This is a, an allegorical picture of the eye of God, God being punched in the eye, and the waters come forth. The fountain of the great deep were broken up. The largest rivers in the world are under the crust of the earth. Not the Mississippi or the Nile. The largest rivers are under the earth. What happened? The earth went whoosh, like that. And there wasn't anybody running up the ramp to the ark. No, no, no I let us in. That's not what it was. They knew not until Noah went into the ark and judgment hit them like that. And Noah went up on a tide away from the fountains of the great deep as that crust just broke open and the ark went whoosh, like that. And there was no time to repent. It's not like, I see Jesus in the sky, I'm repent right now, God save me. That's what people think they're going to do. I'll wait till the last minute. And then when I see him in the sky, I'll say, Lord, I, I want to get saved. I accept you. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, aren't they? <laughs> Hurry it up. What they could do is put it on a computer and, and have it go, and say, that way they could. <laughs> yeah, it's too slow. Do I have any time, Mike? About a minute 30, golly. I don't know where to go to here because I was going back. Whew, go back to the 20th chapter of Revelation. I'm coming back next week. Gosh, there's so many things on this. Let me show you one other thing. I'm going to get to this next week, but go to Ezekiel, the 38th chapter. Ezekiel 38, and this goes along with what we've been talking about. 38th chapter of Ezekiel is like the evening news with Tom Brokaw. That's actually what it's like. 
I'm just I'm not going to read the whole chapter. This is where all these nations attack Israel. And look here. I'll just give this to you since we brought this out. Uh, remember we said that God would be a wall of fire around his people. Right? And that's the iris of the eye. Well, this is where he sends Gog up against against Israel, verse 9, Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land. Thou and all thy bands and many people with thee. Thus saith the Lord God, It shall come to pass that at the same time shall things come into thy mind, and thou shalt think an evil thought, and thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of of unwalled villages. That's because God's going to be a wall of fire about us. And when we are attacked as the church, we are heavenly Jerusalem. We don't have a moat outside, a big tall wall and a moat for them to overcome. What's going to be in the Old Testament, the thing that protected a city was the walls. The walls, were, the walls were considered a fortress. They were considered more than a fortress. Mary and I watched a special the other night on castles, and they said castles were a machine. Castles actually were built and structured to the point where they were something that they could attack you with. Even if you could get inside the first walls, they said, once you got inside the first walls, they had the entire quadrangle and they're surrounded by windows with the guys with arrows. They, if you got inside, you were still dead. It was an attacking machine. Well, God is the wall around us and Gog is going to attack the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls, and having neither bars nor gates, this is a picture of the church under attack. Now I'll go into this next. I'm trying to get to this in the study of Gog and Magog, and I'll get back to it. I want to get to the end of chapter 20, or in the middle of chapter 20, Gog and Magog, because you've got a spiritual Gog and Magog. I guess I don't have any time, do I? Well, I'm going to come back, try to get into Gog and Magog next week and finish up. I can't really stop here and go back to history of Israel. I've got too many things we haven't gotten to in Revelation. I hope that as we go through this book of Revelation, from these allegorical viewpoints, you can see these things. When you're going to look at something, notice, think. Think about walls. When you find walls over here, no walls over here, a wall of fire, a wall of fire here, and then you find eyes as a flame of fire surrounding the pupil, that's a wall of fire around Israel. All of this is allegorical pictures that ties all of these facts together into one picture. I hope you can get a hold of some of this. Some of the things I said tonight are very abstract thinking. That's what it is. And you have to think in that vein because that's the way they wrote and that's the way they talked and that's the way God inspired it. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for truth, for your word. Help us to understand and see this book. Lord, help me to, help me to see it and unravel it so we can see what you meant to say to us that we may understand your word. You said blessed is the man that reads this book and understands it, Lord, you didn't mean for it to be a mystery. Reveal it. Unravel the deep meanings in it. God will praise you for it. God, give us strength and health for long years to come, if it's according to your mercy, that we might continue to teach this word. We'll give you praise for all things in Christ's name. Amen.